Uh, my name my name is Arielle Tojur de la Poutrie, and I'm the Global Early Action and Research Advisor for uh, the German Red Cross and the Anticipation Hub. And I have been uh, asked to kind of facilitate the discussion, or at the very least, uh, interview um, Tony Garcia, as well as some of our other colleagues who are joining from the Philippines Red Cross, uh, this conversation about urban early actions. So. Um, as you may know, there's kind of growing interest in conducting early actions in an urban setting. About 55% of the world's population lives in urban areas, and this number is projected to increase to 70% by 2050. Uh, and yet of many of the early actions and the protocols that have um, come through, at least in the Red Cross, but I think also for other organizations, uh, tend to focus on uh, more rural settings and rural environments and what can be done there to mitigate disaster impacts. So uh, we wanted to have this conversation because the Philippines is one of the first national societies, at the least, to pilot these early actions in an urban context. And there's therefore uh, a lot to learn and to discuss. Uh, and urban environments also kind of present some some unique and different challenges, and hopefully we'll hear about some of those today. So uh, along with the colleagues from the Philippines Red Cross, a couple of months ago, we put together a case study on the urban early actions. And a lot of the discussion that we're having now will um, be kind of based on those experiences and can also be reflected somewhat in that case study, which is on the Anticipation Hub, if you are interested in uh, reading in addition to attending this. So with that, I am pleased to introduce uh, our colleagues who are here from the Philippines. Tony Garcia from the Philippines Red Cross. She is one of the national project officers for forecast-based financing in the Philippines. She's in charge of the Luzon region, and she has been with uh, PRC for some time and FBF since 2018. Um, the, since the beginning of phase one of the pilot implementation, before that she was a community-based officer in a branch office of the Philippines. Uh, she currently monitors, or is kind of responsible for 15 different provinces um, overseeing FBF. And then uh, Julia Sasana, who is also a project officer uh, working in the Visayas region and was also previously based in one of the chapter branches, and we are also joined by uh, Elena Suero, who is a project delegate supporting FBF from the German Red Cross. And so the majority of the conversation will likely take place between myself and Tony, but in case uh, one of the others chimes in, you know who everyone is. Uh, so with that, I believe we are going to begin by actually directing some questions back at you, our audience. So. Lydia, I think you can. Yes, thank you, Ariel. So I'm going to put a Menti link in the chat and we have a first question for you. So let me know if there's any problems accessing that. So I will just get this up. Yes, so, um, oh, good. Yeah, it's working. I've seen them coming in. So I'll just start to present that. Go. Great. Okay. Looks like we have three people who are definitely considering early actions in their work. I'm wondering if they are our colleagues from the Philippines Red Cross or if they are um, different colleagues here today. Let me know if anybody's having trouble accessing the link. Five. Oh, okay. Great. Okay, so maybe just to confirm, so nobody here has um, not considered um, urban early actions in their work. 
or you can write it in the chat if you're struggling with the, the Mentimeter. And that, of course, might explain why everyone is here. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Which is great. Perfect. Okay, so let's move to the oh, open voting. Just to double check, is it still open voting? Voting is closed. Oops. Okay. Close voting. Okay, just let me know if there's problems because sometimes Menti takes on its own um, uh, decisions. So we will move to the next slide. So what are the challenges that you've encountered while operationalizing early actions? This one might take a bit more time to think about. And do let me know if there's a problem with the mentee. Oh, great. Yes, they're coming in. Perfect. Funding, OK. Identifying and registering the most vulnerable. Yep, absolutely. The targeting. Exploratory phase. Yep, we're just experimenting and learning. Capacity building. Scale of the hazards, OK. Targeting again, yep. Great. I think we have the five people that um, answered in the last one again answered here. So we'll move on. We have, oh, disabled comments. That's not what I meant to do. Oh, one more. Great. Um, streamlining organizational procedures to be fit for early actions and institutionalizing early actions. Absolutely. And I think that's something that goes beyond and many of these that goes beyond actually the urban context as well. Brilliant. Okay. Oh, great. Okay. I'll leave it for another second then. We're getting more coming in. Great. So community engagement. Yep, absolutely. And the donor regulation for AA does not exist. Okay. Would anybody like to share a bit more about something that they've added here? You're very welcome to unmute yourself and, and share. I think we have time. We're still all warming up. Hopefully maybe after the, after the presentation, then we can uh, have a few more um, questions and, and conversations, but this is already really useful for um, kickstarting the, the conversation. And let's go to the, the last question. So what are you most interested to learn about today? Yes, great. Definitely the private sector. I think it's something we're not talking about a, a lot um, in comparison to other um, topics and stakeholders engagement in anticipatory action. So I think it's definitely worth us unpicking this more together and seeing how the anticipation hope can support and um, how we can work together more. What's how to start an urban AA? Yeah, absolutely. What are the key steps and the partners to consider? Experience beyond the Philippines or across? Yep. Hopefully we uh, have some people here today who can share, share more, or at least have some connections or ideas of where some other initiatives have, have been happening in this area. Measuring success, yes, that's always an interesting, um, an interesting one. Great. Okay, looks like we've lots to learn. So maybe we should get started. I'll hand back over to, uh, to Ariel. Um, yeah, to start the dialogue. And um, hopefully we can learn lots 
lots that's on this um, page. So thank you for contributing. I know it's, um, yeah, it's um, always a challenge to get into some of these apps and use them. So thank you for um, bearing with us. Oh, and we have some more coming in. Yeah. Okay, over to you, Ariel. Yeah, and I don't know, maybe you want to leave it open and then yeah. people can add while we, <laughs> we can come yeah. back to it at the later stage of the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I will now uh, start the conversation with Tony. And uh, Tony, I know you said you were having some connection challenges and I didn't see before if you, there you go, <laughs> said hello. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I believe that she will be perhaps turning off her video again. Uh, <laughs> shortly, but um, the first question that I have for you is uh, how and why did the Philippines Red Cross decide to broach the challenge of urban early actions? Um, actually, ma'am, um, it's a long process how we identify this um, early action that can be fit on the urban context, but based on our, my mic, ma'am, is okay, no, ma'am, and my connection, yeah. Thank you. So, apology, ma'am, if I will turn off my camera for me to interrupt, not to interrupt this discussion. No problem. Yeah. So, actually, ma'am, based on my the, based on the experience of the the Red Cross, considering the the context of the Philippines, we're in based on the risk analysis that we conducted in relation to the development of the early action protocol, specifically for Taipun and linked to the secondary EAP that we developed, which is the flooding or the flood EAP. So based on the risk analysis that we have, the most common event that usually happened or um, experienced in the country, specifically in the Philippines, of course, is the number one is because of the storm, which is around 50% over the 500 event that happens in the Philippines. And secondly, it was followed by a flooding around 24% and other events such as landslide, quakes, and volcanic eruptions. And I think um, because of this event, of course, we know that if there is a risk, there is a um, um, equal causes of that risk or um, event, which is focuses more on the the cause on the death and affected or it will affect persons specifically on their livelihood and health and it also because of this event it also causes damage to infrastructures not only on houses but also on the small medium enterprises or the small businesses and and because of this event it does not affect only on the rural areas, but also on the urban areas. And we think um, which has a, a in, in, in urban areas, there is a higher number of person, also specifically on SME, who is relying on a single home-based business. So we call it here in the Philippines as a sari-sari store or a convenient store. So other than that, we also identified um, eateries, shoemaking, rug making, and street vendor and tricycle drivers. So this is how we decide how, how or we wanted to, to prioritize the urban early action. So. Great, thank you. Uh, and how did the then once you decided to proceed with those with urban early actions, uh, how did you decide on the relocation of businesses specifically? Actually, ma'am, um, based on the specific data on the risk analysis that we've conducted. Other than that, um, we also establish a core group. Um, actually, we call it on the provincial level, a provincial core group wherein in every provinces or areas that we prioritize or we targeted, um, there are uh, members or the members of this core group are usually coming from the different offices from the government. So most of them are coming from the DRR or the Department of or Disaster Risk Reduction Office. Some of them are coming from Pagasa, um, 
social welfare and development office the budget etc and um this is the the major um member of the core group and one of them suggested during this core group meeting and workshop that we conducted way back 2020 in Cagayan because Cagayan there is an urban area in Cagayan which is focuses more in into Gigarao City so one of the member of the core group suggested also to invite the um, Department of Trade and Industry so this is one of the agency of the government but and the primary this agency the primary agency in the promotion and the development of MSME or they call it as Ministry of Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises. So during this core group um, and mini workshop that we conducted, um, the DTI expressed um, to also prioritize those um, small businesses which is located in urban area. So he suggests to to include um to include in our targeting these small businesses because based on their experience if there is a flooding specifically in Tugigaraw city wherein this market is located um they don't have an access to buy basic necessities so to be able for them to have this continue um continue um continue accessing these basic necessities, they suggest to, if there is an impending or if there will be an incoming flooding, why not we relocate these small businesses or this market into a safe place wherein we already address the loss of income to, to, to individual or community. At the same time, we are also addressing the the access of um, community to buy basic necessities so we're we're not only focusing more on the the addressing the loss of income but also for those people that needs to have access on basic commodities if there is an impending hazard or disaster so this is how we develop and prioritize the urban relocation, ma'am, because of the assistance coming from the provincial core group, specifically from DTI, ma'am. Great. And, and how did the design and uh, simulation, I suppose, since I don't believe you had an activation yet, of the early actions of, of this relocation of uh, small businesses in an urban environment differ from uh, the design and implementation of other early actions for rural communities, specifically kind of were there elements of that process that were more difficult or easier given the urban context? Oh, I hope we haven't lost her. Are you still there, Tony? Oh, I think we have lost her. <laughs> okay, um, perhaps um, to answer that question, Ariel, maybe we can share the slide and, and go through that just in case. It, oh no, she is, she is still here. Um, Oh, yes, Tony, you're still here. Ah, uh, yes. Actually, ma'am, we can present the the slide. Okay, the, perfect. Yeah. So, apology, ma'am, if I uh, I cut my connection. So, no based problem. on the process, yeah. So, based on the 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 process that we that the we conducted both for urban and rural. Actually, for urban areas, they have different cultures in terms how people live or what livelihood did, do they have in the community and also the design of their houses and of course yung, um, the structure of their businesses like for example the the small medium enterprises ma'am they have different um structure like for example they have this rolling rolling market so and there is a fixed market wherein they cannot um they cannot move their market unlike with the rolling market so they can move anywhere and 
for the early action in rural areas, it focuses mostly on or mainly on agriculture, wherein in rural area, it is the most abundant in rural area, more on agriculture. So. Great. And what were the main lessons from the simulation and what would you pass on to other national societies who might be interested in uh, exploring urban early actions? Actually, ma'am, um, based, based on the, the previous questions that, the few, that you've dis discussed, um, the PRC have this established um, partners on the province level, not only on the provincial level, but also on the municipal and down to the barangay level. So I think one of the recommendations that we can recommend is to have this established network wherein we can, um, we can identify or assist us in the identification, not only on the identification, but on the execution of the early action protocol. So it was stated in the, the presentation that to have a build relationship, not only on the partners, but also on the beneficiary. And of course, engage with the stakeholder in every stages. And of course, capacity training or conduct um, training and exposure, not only for the PRC or the implementer, but also we invite um, our partners for them to be... Um, to be aware on the process, not only to be aware or increase awareness, but also for them to create a sense of ownership with the with this um, um, initiative that we have. Great, thank you. And then this may be a, a question uh, for all of the representatives from <laughs> PRC who are here on the call, but what, if anything, have you done kind of since the simulation and the perhaps even the results of this case study that we put together a few months ago to update your work on early actions? Has there been anything uh, new that you might want to share that hasn't been reflected in kind of the existing documents, et cetera? I think, ma'am, I will be I will be answering that question. Um, in terms of the um, for the simulation, ma'am, we haven't done any update in terms of the our urban early action, but this simulation exercise that we we conducted, it um, it give us the opportunities to assess or to examine the capacity of the of the implementers or the actors of the early action protocol. So during this um, simulation, we already um, check or assess if this um, execu execution of the EAP can be properly executed on the, on the community level. And it also, in the execution of this early action protocol or EA, specifically for SME, it highlights different or various stages for us to assess the, the, the feasibility of the implementation of the actual um, activation of the EAP. And also, ma'am, it gives us a, we already have the, we already established the network between the PRC PRC sub chapters or chapters and with the government offices. So that's it, ma'am. Maybe my colleagues can add on my on my answer, ma'am. Yeah, Julia Soylen, is there anything else that you would like to add on that final question or just anything that you would like to, to compliment with? All right, well then, um, if not, I think, Lydia, now we are opening it up for, for questions from the audience, is that correct? Yep, yep, we'd really love to hear from you. 
I think go ahead and unmute. I mean, we are such a small group or if you'd like, you can raise your hand, but. Uh... Okay, I see Maya, very interesting. Was wondering what kind of organized groups, community-based organizations, people's organizations are involved. In my mind, urban communities seem to be more organized. Excellent question. Tony? Um, yes, ma'am. Actually, ma'am, to address um, the question of Ma'am Maya, actually, um, for the PRC process, under the disaster management service, we have this process that we usually do in the community, wherein we establish the so-called a barangay committee, wherein on the level of the province or municipal level, we organize this core group. So this core group is the one more on technical support for the PRC on the identification, implementation, updating of the EAP. But specifically down to the barangay level, we have this barangay committee. This barangay committee is the, the committee on the barangay wherein they, they assist the PRC on the identification of possible beneficiary, identification of the possible evacuation, possible route wherein how we will go to the evacuation center, etc. And, and also they are the one who, who, who are more engaged on the community in terms of this um, identification or prioritization of the beneficiary, not only on that, but also on the implementation. So I hope, Mamaya, I already addressed your question on that. I, I address your question to my answer. Right. Yes, she says, thank you. Um, would anybody else like to share something in the chat or feel free to unmute? Um, actually, ma'am, other than the barcom that we have, I received this uh, message coming from my colleague, Mr. Julius Azania. He has this difficulty in, in accessing his microphone. But other than the barcom, in every um, in every there is an organization established in the community like the TODA. TODA specifically more on the tricycle driver. But specifically on the SME, there is a market vendor organization. Other than that, we also have this uh, Red Cross 143 volunteer that, we, that the PRC established in every community. So that's it. I think Ma'am Elena wanted to add something also. Yeah, I see that. Uh Go ahead, Elena, you can uh, unmute and speak or you can type it into the chat, whatever you prefer. Yeah, no, that's also um, something that um, it's an ongoing process, like the establishment of conversations with uh, kind of umbrella organizations, um, as Maya said, uh, like chambers of commerce or any other kind of representative institutions that uh, would be used as to represent and to to better understand the needs of these um, small, medium enterprises. Um, and however, the informal markets seem to be um, quite um, in the bird, like, yeah, hidden or so informal that um, many of them are not registered and some of them are not in contact with these organizations. So I think it's a matter of balancing kind of uh, the dialogue and. Uh, try to find a yeah way to address their needs and also have a conver direct conversations with them to understand the, the processes and and their needs. But yeah, also um, what um, apparently it was found out uh, how uh, these uh, SMEs uh, are also very more empowered in terms of uh, uh, knowledge and also uh, somehow kind of more busy, so it's, it tends to uh, be more difficult to get uh, in, uh, engaged with them. Um, but yeah, that's so uh, I wanted to share the, also the need to do like both sides of, of, of the coin in the conversation. Thanks. Great, thank you. I see another question in the chat. How do you find space to re, uh, 
to reallocate the SME or to relocate the SME and get permission to use the space when the AI, A, A is activated. Is the space nearby the evacuation shelters people use when the early warning is evacuated? Excellent questions. Um, yes, ma'am. Actually, during the preparatory phase, ma'am, or during the preparatory or actions to be taken prior on the activation of the EAP, that's one of the the role of the the barcom together with our Red Cross one to one four three to identify a space wherein they can relocate the market. Yes, ma'am. Um, it is identified also in a nearby evacuation shelter or evacuation center wherein they can easily have an access to buy basic commodities. Okay. Yeah, and I suppose we didn't provide a great deal of uh, upfront uh, background on, <laughs> on the actions themselves, but correct me if I'm wrong, I think that there were two different models, some kind of depending on the specific geographic location. And one was that they were relocating them to the evacuation shelters. And then the other was that they were doing the roving store. So essentially packing some materials onto a truck and moving around to sell from the back of the truck. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Actually, that's correct, ma'am. We have two options. We're in, um, we have this mobile market wherein they can roll within the community. And we also have identified an evacuation area wherein they, they need to, to set up their, their market in that evacuation center or evacuation area wherein it is near the evacuation center. So we have this also, this rolling store now, wherein we hired um, truck to roll within the community to continuously have an access to basic commodities. Yeah. And I don't recall, was there a reason that you chose one in one area and one in another? Actually, ma'am, the criteria on the which one to use is depending on the, the, the area or the community. Like, for example, in, in a community, there is no, um, the road is not accessible because of flooding. So we can identify in that community a, a set up of the market in an near the evacuation center. But if the community is not flooded, um, we can use the rolling market, ma'am. Okay, so if the, the market area is flooded but not the rest of the community, then that's more suitable for the rolling market. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay, great, thanks. Uh, and Lydia, does anyone here have an experience of early warning or early action in urban areas in other countries to share? That was going to be one of my questions to open it up beyond. Thank you. I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but I just thought, you know, it's it's not that you need to have necessarily implemented an early action protocol in another country, but I think a lot of these um, challenges and, and lessons are quite applicable across DOR projects or early warning projects. It'd be interesting to hear if this if this resonates. Yeah, or even to hear a bit more about uh where people are in kind of the process of thinking about it, if it's just something that's yeah. <laughs> that's on the radar or if they're actively uh, actively searching for actions, et cetera. And if so, maybe how they're going about it, that might be different. Let's see, Mel, uh, you work with a range of national societies around the world. What advice do you have for engaging with private sector to undertake early action? Um, so um, actually, it's a good question in terms of the um, engagement of the, not only on the private, but the government sector. Actually, in the Philippines, or specifically for the PRC or Philippine Red Cross, um, we engagement, the engagement of this private sector or government agency is very active on our process, not only on the development, but also on the implementation and also 
um, we lobby to them what um, because um, they already um, own this um, early action on the community for them to be able to completely own this um, initiative that we have um, the government offices specifically on the DRR they have this plan they usually do a planning wherein they allocate funding in every actions on the preparedness response etc so since they are an active they are participate actively participate in the processing or updating of our eap they regularly attend meetings they regularly attend workshop etc um, they see the that the FBF concept can be adopted into their plan. And there are provinces that have this initiative already. So I think um, to address yung, the question of um, Mel is they need to be engaged or uh, um, we need to up update and engage them in every phases that we do. So. I think um, maybe some of my colleagues can also add on that or agree on my suggestion, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, Elena or Julius, feel free to chime in if you have something to add. Otherwise, I see from Maya in the meantime. Uh, here in Sudan, we are still kickstarting our FBF project. We are also facing Flood is a hazard and cities are, of course, affected. German Red Cross has recently implemented a cash for business initiative. So it might be interesting to consider business relocation as an AA to protect their income and assets in the case of floods. Still work on progress, though. Uh, and she apologizes, but she's using the chat box because of the bad internet connection. Yes. Uh, So uh, first, just to say that's it's very interesting to hear that something similar might be then uh, replicated or adapted for Sudan. And I imagine there's quite a bit, you know, quite an interesting conversation <laughs> you can have. It'll be interesting to see how that evolves. Thank you for sharing, Maya. Um, and Margie then says, has an AA protoc protocol for the SME been activated or, sim or simulated? I will let uh, Tony answer that though. Uh, yes, ma'am. It's already um, tested through a simulation exercise way back um, last year in Butuan City, um, Agusan del Norte. So, ma'am Elena um, is raising his hand, her hand. Yeah, go ahead, Elena. Uh, thanks, Tony. It was more connected to the previous uh, question um, and actually connected to this one because we haven't activated. Last year, we kind of um, missed one big event in country and there was um, uh, kind of a control, controversial conversations um, for modification of the trigger. And one of the options that we found was to um, develop 24 hours early actions um, because um, the missing the, the the event was partially and mostly actually uh, due to rapid intensification. So the idea is to develop a 24 hours trigger and 24 hours early actions, and um, by also conversations with local actors and especially PRC, one of these 24 hours early actions, um, their preference is the um, relocation um, and uh, displacement of uh, assets, um, especially for uh, SMEs and farmers and fisher folks. So um, just do the basic um, move out of the items and support them with the transport and the storage. So something like very specific and kind of uh, imminent and it needs to be um, yeah light on resources and uh, actually uh, quite uh, fast, right, in terms of execution. So just to say that um, these actions are very accepted and well received by the community and in this case PRC. So I think um, the challenges to execute them are there, but um, 
those are things that we uh, operations people need to like kind of overcome but um the and see the viability but actually the pertinence it's uh, it's already there and, and established so yeah i will yeah just for maya also to encourage and support her in, in the process thanks Great, very interesting to hear. And just uh, in case anybody on this call is not familiar with what the rapid intensification is, she's just referring to the fact that you know there's maybe a forecasted event, but it doesn't look like it's going to meet the trigger uh, threshold, or it doesn't meet it within you know, the the seventy two hour mark or whatever, and then all of a sudden uh, the storm becomes quite strong and. Uh, is quite impactful, but there's not enough time anymore to implement the early actions that were outlined in the protocol. All right, is any, I think we even had somebody new join and even if you haven't been around for the beginning of the conversation, please feel free to chime in right now. We just have kind of an open discussion. And one of the questions out to the group is, what is what is it that you're working on in terms of urban early actions? Is there something that you'd like to share, a question you'd like to, to raise, um, general feedback you'd like to get? All right. Well, if not, Lydia. Yes, brilliant. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for the conversation. So we have one last Menti question that I just opened, um, and this is about how the Anticipation Hub can support um, work on urban early action. So the Anticipation Hub is all about facilitating knowledge exchange, learning, guidance, advocacy around different areas of anticipatory action. So we'd love to hear from you more about what else the Anticipation Hub could be doing. Should we be um, organizing more conversations like this? Um, many of you are familiar with our dialogue platforms. Do we need to have more urban focus? Um, we have um, our urban early action page, which I'll share again, just in case anybody um, missed that one. And we'd really invite you to like contribute to that page if you have blogs or new resources to write up your lessons or your challenges um, in addressing um, anticipatory action in, in urban settings. So we'd just love to hear from you more about what we should be doing. Like for example, around different topics, we have working groups, um, on conflict, on health, on earth observation, risk financing. Is this something that's needed for um, urban settings too um, or not? So we're just really open to, to getting your advice and guidance on how we should advance in this area and support you. Let's see, and again, let me know if there is any problems with the Menti. I don't see anything coming yet. Or also feel free to write in the chat or um, unmute or raise your hand. Um, welcome, Tanya. Uh, she has introduced herself. She says, thank you for the conversation. She's new in the space. She's from Honduras. And she's not able to speak because of the time of night, it's midnight. Uh, but she is excited uh, about learning through her job. It's great, Tanya. In, in case you missed some of the other rest of the conversation, it will be recorded and it'll be put on the, the urban page, Lydia, or it will be put on the community conversations page or both. Um, it will be put on both. Yep. Yeah. So we have a YouTube channel and a playlist with all of the different community conversations. So it'll be added there, um, hopefully today or tomorrow. And then we'll also put a link on the urban page that we shared there. So um, yeah, and I'll also send it by email to everybody that registered um, for the event directly as well. And some of these other links that I'll talk about as well. And if you have any links to share about any resources you have um, or anything you think should go on this page, um, please let us know.
Great, we're having some input come in. Definitely the first one, sharing best practice and lessons learned. So, you know, there's many ways we could do that. So if you're familiar with the um, uh, dialogue platform, so we should definitely make sure that we're having sessions around urban um, and prioritizing that topic at the, at the dialogue platform. So we'll try our best to do that. And then if anybody is producing any new knowledge on um, urban, urban settings, please let us know so we could host such a conversation again. Um, <laughs> or you could invite you to write a blog post for our newsletter. Um, you're very welcome to do that. And then around the joint feasibility study. So I feel like this is possibly less of a focus for the anticipation hub, but more from the actual projects um, themselves. So definitely um, that's an important one, but perhaps less so for the anticipation hub, but I uh, can clarify that. Um, sharing practical examples, definitely. And um, I'll also highlight um, in another slide some of the different tools that we have on the anticipation hub. So we have the early action database, um, the trigger database. Um, and so it's, I think it's really important that we also have urban examples in those databases too. So uh, again, we need your support in, in contributing to those. Yeah. And I will just reiterate that if you don't mind me jumping yeah, in. That me. gives me time to get the link. <laughs> um, is the, uh, you know, in terms of the, the practical examples, et cetera. Um, it's, yeah, we have the early action database but really it's only populated with information we get. So if you are even considering uh, urban early actions, it does these, the actions that are in the early action database don't need to be tested. They don't need to be even in a protocol. They can just be the product of brainstorms, things that you thought about and then perhaps even realized were not feasible in your particular context, but that might serve as inspiration for others in other contexts. So um, you can see there's a link there uh, to me, actually, you can email me directly, uh, either through the website or I can put my email in the chat and uh, we can discuss how to get that information into the early action database because those resources are really only as rich as the information that is shared with us. <laughs> Great. And we see some other ones coming in around regional research on the effectiveness of AA. I think this is definitely um, a really important one. And you, you see the growth of initiatives like um, the uh, Academic Alliance on Anticipatory Action, which if I'm not wrong, that there is also um, an institute in the Philippines that's part of that alliance. So I definitely think that there, there will be more of a push around um research on the effectiveness of AA so and um, we're definitely willing to, to collaborate and we also have um now that I'm showing you the hub we also have a science and research page um and here you can share some different resources but also there is the anticipatory action roadmap and if you have um particular ideas um about what should be in such a roadmap so early action so urban um you can populate this here. So I'll also add this link to the chat. But you're very welcome to, to contribute to. Um, and conversations and cooperation between the technical areas of AA and urban resilience. Yeah, I think this is a really important one because urban resilience is definitely or urban flood risk management, the longer term um, infrastructure development, growth development in urban areas. Um, definitely you can capture synergies with anticipatory action there and um, for example I think the World Urban Forum happened recently and I know within German Red Cross there's an urban urban team and I was hoping Thomas would be with us today and I know that he has more of a network in that space um, so definitely I think we could uh, work on bringing um, more people to the to the conversation and maybe that's also through the anticipation hub we have to be more aware of that and um, thinking about how we can get some of these um, actors involved. Um, and definitely we are pushing on government engagement, but in this context, very much local government, um, city governments, how can we also get them um, part of this conversation and collaborate more with them. And um, might be of interest, or some of you might be familiar with Resurgence. They're um, another organization who's done a lot of work on, in urban areas, I think Tanzania more so, um, in Africa. They've just become a partner of the Anticipation Hub. I was also hoping that they'd join us today. Um, so um, 
yeah, we can definitely build connections with some of those Anticipation Hub existing partners, but also um, widening that spectrum of um, actors that are engaged in the, in the conversation. So definitely agree with that one. Great. Anything else to add, Ariel or, or Tony? I have like one minute just to run through a couple of things on the on the anticipation hub, but I, I leave it to you to wrap up before I before I do that. And um, yeah, thank you for all your input into the Menti. Yeah, I think I'd just like to say thank you all for attending. Thank you, uh, Tony and Julia and Elena for participating and providing your or sharing your insights and your experience. Uh, thanks, Lydia, for organizing. And um, yeah, look forward to continued conversations. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tony. Thanks a lot. Great. Okay, I'll just um I'll just share a couple of slides very quickly. Um this one. So I just wanted to let you know, in case you're not familiar with the different resources on the Anticipation Hub. So we have, um, in addition to what I just showed, we also have a Anticipatory Action Community Directory. So here you can find um, some of um, yeah, the different connections within the network. So if you're looking for somebody who's working on a particular topic or in a particular organization, you can search um, to find your match um, and you can understand what they offer, what they're looking for from the anticipatory action community. So I pop that link in the chat and I'll also share these by email. Um, we also have different working groups within the anticipation hub. So we have one around conflict, earth observation, health is the, the latest one, um, risk financing, meals, the monitoring and evaluation and protection, gender and inclusion. So we don't have one uh, specifically on urban, I guess it kind of cuts through all of them. So if you um, want to know more information about them, I'm also going to send uh, the link here. And please do just, just reach out. I'll drop my email in the chat also before you drop off. Um, um, so please feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, a dialogue platforms, as I've been mentioning a, a couple of times. So these are um, our... <laughs> really uh, the core of the Anticipation Hub and our exchange activities and we have the regional and global one happening each year. We had brilliant participation last year and this year we just had the Africa Dialogue Platform and we're planning for the Latin America one, Asia Pacific and global um, happening this year too. So you can find all the information um, from them in this link and do keep um, up to date with our events tab. So if you go to the website and click events, you'll find out more of the specific details on the upcoming events um, related to dialogue platforms and beyond. And here's our newsletter. So I'm bombarding you with lots of links, um, but please do sign up to our newsletter. So um, this goes out every two months. We try to really collate and curate um, lots of different um, resources around anticipatory action and, and give you a good um, impression of what we've been up to for the last two months and what our partners have been up to. Um, so, for example, I just shared the last one, which is very much about our engagement in the global platform on DRR. Um, and uh, we also give updates on some of the activations of our the action protocols and any new resource pages that we have um, um, yeah, on the Anticipation Hub. And then I mentioned some of the databases. So we shared already the links to the um, Early Action Database, but we also have a global map on anticipatory action, which um, you can find here and you can explore more about, oh, that's my actual alarm, <laughs> um, which you can explore more um, about um, what is happening on anticipatory action across the world. And yeah, so we just to let you know that we have another um, we have another community conversation happening next week and you are very welcome to join that. So it's all about how to use humanitarian open street map in your work. Um, and oops, sorry, I've just sent the wrong one. Um, and, you know, I think that also overlaps with urban context very much as well. So it would be really interesting if you could join us again next week for that conversation. And if you have any suggestions for a conversation, please do um, let us know. Um, and we'd be very happy to facilitate that. 
So yeah, we've just hit the top of the hour and thank you all for, for joining. Thanks again to all our speakers and Ariel for hosting the discussion and um, everyone from the Philippines Red, Red Cross. Thanks, thanks so much for your time. And I hope that it's been useful for our, all our participants and please do get in touch. We'll be sending um, an email with the different contact information on all the links that I've been sharing. So yeah, enjoy the rest of your day and um, hopefully connect with you soon. Thanks, Lydia. Thank you, everyone.